Okay, can you all hear me well? Yes. Excellent. So good morning, everyone. Um, we are the Water Conservation Group, and we are very excited that this day has finally come. So today, uh, we want to share with you, as uh, Catherine mentioned, our vision for on-site water conservation and reuse systems in urban homes. My name is Luciana Belknap. I'm Sarah Khan. I'm Shabana Rahim. So our project has been motivated by th three predominant issues regarding water availability. First, globally, freshwater resources are scarce and only about 1.2% of the water on Earth is accessible for human consumption, highlighting the issue of water scarcity. Next, regionally, combined sewer overflows from combined sewer systems releasing contaminants directly into waterways due to outdated wastewater infrastructure causes a substantial amount of water water pollution and vital waterways. And finally, locally focusing on New York City, residential water usage is 84% of the total utility water consumption and we are motivated to explore ways in minimizing this. Next slide, please. I'd like to introduce some key terms that we'll be using throughout our presentation. We have precipitation harvesting, which is the collection of precipitation, including rain, snow, sleet, and hail as shown in the image for repurposing before the precipitation can soak into the ground or enter storm drains and waterways. Residential wastewater reclamation is the reuse of gray water as an on-site alternative residential water source. And gray water is wastewater that does not encounter human waste. Black water is wastewater that does encounter human waste. And the image on the bottom shows the various sources of gray water and black water. Next slide, please. Our proposed and research methods of water, water conservation and precipitation harvesting uh, are precipitation harvesting and gray water reclamation. We will be modeling both systems in two different dwellings to better understand how to maximize potable water savings in an urban environment. Next slide, please. Now I'll introduce two selected representative dwellings that our proposal was created around. The first dwelling is a two-story single family home located in South Ozone Park, Queens with two floors and a basement. This property is about 3,275 square feet and was selected by us due to its unique property shape and landscaping, as you can see in the images below. This property is, oh, sorry. The, the total number of occupants is three adults. The figures show two aerial images of the front and backs of the property. Next slide, please. The second representative dwelling is a multifamily building located in Prospect Lefferts, Brooklyn. It's approximately 6,643 square feet with six units, one backyard, two terraces, and three balconies. The total number of occupants is 10 people, and the images show two aerials of the front and back of the building along with the front facade. Next slide, please. Now we have indoor water consumption patterns for both dwellings. The pie charts show consumption broken down by the various household uses, and the highest demand was found in toilet flushing for both the single family home at 33 gallons and the multifamily building at 130 gallons daily. Total daily indoor consumption, excluding yard water usage, adds up to 136 gallons daily in the single family home and 589 gallons daily in the multifamily building. Next slide, please. Okay, so our current scenario. In America, this is what our current water system looks like. This is just a general box diagram depicting separation of black water from the entire wastewater collection line. Gray water is water used in sinks and showers that can be treated and used once again to flush toilets. According to our box diagrams, our box diagram, all fixtures use drinking water provided by the city line and all the water used by these fixtures are led out of the home to the wastewater treatment facility. We would, as shown, the wastewater pipe is always under the potable water supply. We would like to separate gray water from black water and reuse the gray water to keep it out of the sewer system. This reduces the chance of polluting local water bodies. This also lessens the immense amount of stress on our wastewater line and facilities. For our proposal, we have decided to reuse all gray water for toilet flushing. In addition to this, we would like to collect precipitation from the roof via the gutters, as well as the surrounding surface area as shown in the illustration in the top left. And our box diagram, the cyan line is 
which is the line along the roof and gutter. We just covered the potable and black water supply lines. However, here, the black water line is only receiving from the toilet. The lavender line seen here is the, wa is the water that is collected from the sinks and showers, as well as the dishwashing and washing machines. This water, this water is then treated and pumped back to the toilet for flushing. Next, we have the separation of black water from total wastewater collection lines, which will remain undisturbed. To clarify, we would like all potable water, black water, and gray water to be completely separate. This requires separate plumbing to allow it to exit the property. The potable water will enter the home through the city main via a one, via a one inch copper pipe. The black water will exit the home via a four inch PVC pipe. The black water will exit. We will be using three check valves, backflow preventers, and shutoff valves to stabilize our design. So next we have the first floor of our single family home. This is our first representative dwelling, the single family home chosen for its unique lot, both in size and location. This is a plan of the basement, which I will walk us through. Starting from the left here, we have our city main and sump pump, which supplies drinking water to all fixtures of the home. The plumbing indicated in green remains unchanged as it will serve as a backup water supply for our design. Next, we have gray water collected from the sink and shower, as well as the washing machine. This water will then be treated and plumped back to the toilet for use for use being the lavender line. Lastly, we have our cyan line, which is the stormwater line, and this is treated stormwater. So the cyan and the green path will often tie into each other via a shutoff valve, since both the city water and stormwater can be used in sinks and showers. For the landscape of the single family home, fire retention methods were proposed to capture precipitation from green spaces and surrounding paved areas of the property. Two rain gardens would be constructed at the south and the east ends of the guard of the of the pro of, excuse me of the property, as shown in the plot plan below. A cross section analysis is provided on the bottom left to indicate what each of the six layers in the, the rain garden will be consisting of. Beneath the required layers is an under drain pipe that will be installed to transport the collected precipitation directly to storage cisterns in the basement of the dwelling as the top view of the rain garden render shows with all the necessary plumbing being buried beneath within the yard. The size of the rain gardens were determined by the volume of stormwater received in each area and the size of the area being served by the garden. We consulted a construction and retrofitting water conservation company for assistance with our proposed systems, the Greater Good Industries LLC, which serves the Northeast area, and recommends, and they recommended native hydrophilic plant species to withstand wet conditions and to support biodiversity to be planted within the proposed rain gardens. Next slide, please. So moving on, we have our first floor of the single family home. Everything in the bathroom and kitchen is attached to the city. Is attached to, oh, sorry, it's, it's skipped over. Okay, sorry. Moving on, we have the first floor of the single family home. Everything in the bathroom and kitchen is attached to the city water in green, which also doubles as the, as the storm water collection supply. The gray water is collected from the two sinks in the bathroom and the kitchen as well as the dishwasher and, and shower, and will be sent downstairs to be treated, which is highlighted in red. Next, we have the multifamily basement. To further expand on our concept, we chose a multifamily dwelling. So starting with the basement from the left here, we have the sump pump and the city water main, which feeds into every fixture known as our backup plan. We also have a, our storm water collection from the roof, via gutters, which is the cyan line, which is tied into the city water line. Towards the back of the building, we have three water treatment fixtures where the water from the sink here will enter the red path and be sent to the toilet from the lavender line, seen here.
And lastly, seen here is a sample floor plan of the multifamily building, depicting the first floor. Starting from the left, we have one kitchen sink, and one bathroom sink and one shower, which will all be connected to the Green City water line. This, the water collected from these fixtures is the red, which is the gray water line, which will be sent downstairs for treatment and brought back upstairs for reuse in the toilets, as seen in the lavender line. Okay, now I'll be talking about our precipitation harvesting system in more detail. Next, please. Okay, so our vision for this system is to decrease indoor drinking water usage, okay? Obviously, these type of systems require storage tanks, but not all tanks are made equally. The ones that are considered safe for drinking water storage must be certified by the National Sanitation Foundation, the NSF. And in fact, many states and localities require that water reuse systems meet NSF requirements. So as mentioned before, each of our study sites can store safely five tanks of 550 gallons each. That provides a total of 2,750 gallons of storage capacity, right? And which results in 33,000 annual gallons of rainwater that could be used for drinking purposes. Now that water conservation potential could be greater if space wouldn't be limited. But both of, of our sites, just like many other existing buildings, don't have enough available space for larger tanks. Next, please. So what would the maximum possible water conservation be in an ideal scenario or uh, where a space is unlimited or if this system was to be incorporated in the designing of a new construction? These two graphs here, uh, in these two graphs, the green bars represent the water conservation potential under the current scenario that I just explained. And then the yellow bars represent the water conservation potential under the ideal scenario. Uh, while the blue bars are the annual gallons of indoor drinking water usage. So let's focus on the single family house data. Uh, under the current scenario, our system is able to provide 88% of the total indoor drinking water needed, okay? But in an ideal scenario, our system wouldn't just be able to provide 100% of the needs for the indoor, for indoor water usage, but also will be able to provide a surplus of reclaimed rainwater that could potentially be used to offset outdoor water demand. Next, please. So how do we make uh, rainwater safe for drinking? The, it is about, I mean, it's about the water purification process. There are three steps involved in this process. The first one being, uh, being known as the screening phase, at which the first volume of rainwater is prevented from entering the tanks because it can contain insects, leaves, debris, right? And once inside the tanks, a uh, device known as the floating filter, which is this bowl in, a ho in the hose, that device ensures that water, the, the only water from just below the surface of the tanks and not from the bottom where settling occurs, exits the tanks. Once the water is outside of the tanks, it's directed to a sedimentation and disinfection system. Okay, the first stop in that separate system is these three uh, blue sedimentation filters. Uh, those, those three cartridges aim at removing very fine particles from human hair to particles that are not, be, not visible to the human eye. All right, uh, so once all particles have been removed, the water then, it, it's directed to the ultraviolet disinfection unit that is stainless steel chamber. And when the water flows to that chamber, UV rays kill bacteria and some viruses uh, within 10 seconds. Finally, we end up with high quality drinking water. Next, please. 
So what are the regulations for using rainwater for drinking purposes? Currently, there are no federal regulations uh, governing this type of uh, this type of this type of schemes, right? But just in the same way as well water is accepted for human consumption, using rainwater is a permissible approach to produce drinking water. So even although the EPA doesn't regulate private wells, they do provide guidelines and recommendations. And those, those same guidance and recommendations must be followed when using treated rainwater for drinking purposes. And the recommendations are concerning the importance of continuously test the water for bacteria and other pollutants, just to ensure that their concentration levels don't exceed national primary drinking water regulations. All right, next please. Okay, so all right, we're, now I'm going to move into our second water conservation method, which is to reclaim gray water on site. Uh, and the goal of this system is to use gray water for flushing toilets instead of high quality drinking water, right? So traditionally, these type of systems use two reservoirs, one that collects gray water and another one that serves as a storage of treated gray water. However, uh, we, we learned about the Hydroloop technology, a Dutch company uh, from the, com the same company that we consulted for this study. And what the Hydroloop technology is, uh, is about is well, it's this gray water recycling system that uses this one unit that not only is able to collect and store gray water, but it can, it can also disinfect gray water for variables non-drinking purposes. Okay, so the graph on the, on the right represents how much drinking water we could say, our sites could save if they implement this system. The blue bars are the annual gallons of indoor water usage, the black bars represent the water demand from toilets, and the gray bars represent the amount of gray water produced by the baths and showers for the multifamily building, and the baths, showers, and washing machines for the single family house. So just if you, if you just focus on, on, the, on the black bars and the gray bars, you can see that the amount of gray water produced by the mentioned effectors can meet the amount of water demand demanded by toilets, right? Which means that in the multifamily building, this system could uh, reduce 28% of the total indoor water needs, right? While in the single family house, the savings uh, will be 30%. Next, please. Okay, so is it safe to recycle gray water? Yes, it is safe when it's properly disinfected in such a way that the presence of bacteria is reduced. But we have to acknowledge that treating gray water for flushing toilets, the quality of that gray water, does not have to be on par with drinking water standards, right? Then the levels, that are, the levels of treatment needed for gray water depend on the quality of the particular gray water source and the match and use. So this table here shows bearing standards for non-drinking end uses, such as, such as flushing toilets. Uh, including, so on the top, you, the stand, the, uh, you can see the standard developed by the National Sanitation Foundation. Uh, on the second row, it's the, uh, it's the standard provided here in New York City. And at the bottom in green, you, you'll see the results of the latest, latest quality testing of the uh, gray water that was treated with the Hydroloop technology. So obviously, uh, you know, if you compare this, you can see that the, the gray water that's being treated with the Hydroloop technology meets requirements and essentially, and definitely is succeeding at decreasing the presence of bacteria. And that's it from me. Thank you, Luciana. So again, we were able to conduct an economic analysis. Water enthusiasts Tiffany and Sean from the Greater Good Industries were able to provide overall costs of implementing both systems in the proposed dwellings. 
Costs were broken down by assets per system. Total capital costs for both systems in the single family home amounted to $17,077 and $29,784 for the multifamily building. Operations and maintenance costs averaged about the same for each dwelling at around $19,000 uh, due to the same water pur purification methods being utilized. The payback timeframe for the single family home came to 18 years and 23 years for the multifamily building. These timeframes are exclusive of operations and maintenance costs because they are variable based on many factors, including regional precipitation received, climate change, and different purification methods. Next slide, please. A regional water conservation analysis was also conducted, uh, which in which four states in various regions of the United States were selected to identify if the proposed water conservation methods would be appropriate in areas besides New York City. These states were specifically selected based on variations in climate and projected water shortages in the future. Water sources, state population, annual precipitation, and water consumption patterns were assessed to distinguish the feasibility of these methods. For the state of California, precipitation harvesting in the north of the state would be appropriate, but not in the south due to such a large variation in precipitation. Gray water reclamation would be feasible due to the limited freshwater sources in the Western United States. California also has enough space for the storage cisterns required for both systems. For New Mexico, the arid desert-like climate deems precipitation harvesting undoable because of the average of 13 inches of precipitation received annually. Preserving water in this region is important because the water sources are being depleted faster than being replenished. Therefore, gray water reclamation would be very, very beneficial in this region. In Florida, water, the water sources of surface water and desalination are being depleted faster than being restored as well. Both proposed systems would be appropriate because Florida receives 53 inches of precipitation annually and there is enough room for storage. In Minnesota, both proposed methods would be beneficial to replace current well water sources, which have been known to be unsafe to human health and lack regular testing. This sources, which have been known, this would replace diminishing the closest freshwater surface water source being Lake Superior. And this sums up our regional analysis. Next slide, please. So this sums up our proposal for incorporating water conservation systems into the daily lives of residents nationwide and possibly worldwide. Thank you for your time and special thanks to Professor Vossel and Tiffany and Sean from the Greater Grid Industries LLC. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you so much team. I will now open it to the audience for questions and comments. You can either just jump in or raise your hand or put something in the chat.